This is podcast number 12, where I am explaining Paul's Midrash in his letter to the Galatians. In the last podcast, we worked on Galatians 3, 6 to 9, and we found two verses from the Hebrew Scriptures that Paul cites using a method of halachic Midrash. I would rather call it Leo Midrash. It's easier to understand, but it's halacha or halachic Midrash. Paul takes two verses that are legally and conceptually similar, and then he conducts an analogy to see the relationship between these two legally and conceptually similar verses to draw out new meaning. Now, Paul is going to continue using methods of Midrash. He is going to first come up with a different method of Midrash that I'll have to explain to you, and then he'll use the same method of Midrash that he did in verses 6 through 9. In verses chapter Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 to 14, we find four quotations from the Hebrew Scriptures, not two, but four. The interpretation of this passage of four verses continues to bewilder theologians whose thoughts echo in an ongoing debate. These verses are notoriously enigmatic, observes one scholar, Hansen. Why, we ask, because Paul expresses his thoughts in a highly condensed and cryptic way, explains Bono. This passage is anything but clear, adds Donaldson. So how do we make sense of these notoriously enigmatic verses when others are so puzzled? We will start by considering the traditional understanding of Galatians 3, 10 to 14 that stems from the plain meaning of the words. But we certainly are not going to stop there because those interpretations I do not think are accurate. So then we will approach this passage from the perspective of Paul's continuing use of legal midrash. Finally, we will compare the two resulting types of interpretation, one from the plain sense of the meaning and the other from Paul's midrash, which will undoubtedly lead to lively discussion. We will begin by reading these verses from the beginning to the end without stopping, and we ask, how is Paul using the four citations from the Hebrew Scriptures? Then, I want you to consider your traditional understanding of Paul's argument in this passage. Verse 10. For how great a number are those out from works of the law? They are under a curse, for it is written. Now here comes Deuteronomy twenty-seven twenty-six. All are thoroughly cursed who do not live by all that is written in the book of the law to do them. And then in verse 11, Paul continues, Now, since no one is made righteous in the sight of God by the law, since, now he cites from Habakkuk 2.4, the one who is righteous will live by faith. Then we go on to verse 12. Now the law is not out from faith, but... Citing from Leviticus 18.5, the one doing them, meaning the commandments of the law, will live by them. And last, in verse 13, we read, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, becoming a curse for us, for it is written. And now we hear from Deuteronomy 21.22, thoroughly cursed is everyone who hangs on a wooden stake. Now, your understanding of these verses likely stems from the plain sense of the words. For example, does the curse of the law mean the law is a curse? If so, how is it a curse? Now, I'm just asking these questions. We're going to answer these questions in a minute, but I, I want you to be curious here and asking questions relative to your own interpretation that you've been taught. And then we ask, does Paul mean that Jews whose religious experience includes study of the law, are under this curse? If so, why? If not, why not? However, if Paul is using ancient methods of legal midrash, 
then the plain meaning of the words is not what Paul intends to convey. How do we make sense of these notoriously enigmatic verses? We will begin with a clue. The plain sense is startling. We have learned that something strange or unusual may signify the presence of deeper meaning. Therefore, rather than trying to understand the literal meaning from the plain sense of the words, we will proceed with the assumption that Paul is continuing to use methods of legal midrash. Let us turn first to what is so startling. There seems to be a contradiction in Paul's argument. Paul accuses those who are associated with works of the law as being under a curse. On the other hand, if they don't do works of the law, if they fail to obey all the laws, they are also under a curse. It seems they are cursed for doing the works of the law, and they are cursed for not doing them. Christopher Stanley has examined the literature on this challenge of interpretation and finds at least four possible explanations. You know, this really draws me in when I find that there's confusion, that theologians are not in agreement on what something means. That is a place where I like to enter and try to work in the scriptures. So, Continuing to look at common interpretations based on a literal understanding, we note that a common approach to this passage depends on an assumption that it is impossible to obey all the laws. This is a supposition because Paul does not explicitly state it, but is this assumption correct? For example, Paul claims elsewhere that he is blameless with regard to the law. That's in Philippians 3, 6. So it appears it is possible to obey all the laws. Then we observe in the context of Deuteronomy 27, 26, which Paul cites in verse 10, that scripture seems to expect obedience to the law and anticipates its attendant blessings. We're supposed to obey the law, and if we do, we get blessed. So, we're now thoroughly puzzled. Is it possible or impossible to completely obey the law? If it is impossible, wouldn't the result be lawlessness among God's people? Certainly, this lawlessness is not what God desires. James Scott has reviewed the resulting scholarly debate on this problem of interpretation, finding no less than eight possible explanations. At this point, we must admit that the passage is anything but clear. Now we turn to the troubling consequences of these literal readings. How can a God of love and compassion give something impossible to observe to those he calls his people? How can he allow curses to fall on them for 2,000 years while they're waiting for the coming of the Messiah. Equally puzzling, even after God sent his Messiah, guess what? There is still sin in the world among God's people. Does this mean that Christian believers are also recipients of God's cursing for failure to be completely righteous? Are Christians also under a curse? What seems strange and startling in this passage continues to bombard us. When Paul uses the phrase curse of the law, what is he trying to tell us? As I reviewed numerous interpretations in the literature, I found a general tendency to conclude that Paul is talking literally about Israel, that is the Jews, upon whom the curse of the law has fallen. Thus, Jews are condemned because of their observance of and reliance upon the law. For example, Beaker argues, Paul drives a radical wedge between Abraham and the Torah on one hand, and between Torah and Christ on the other hand. So, only those with faith in Christ are the true sons of Abraham, concludes Wright. Israel has made the wrong choice 
bringing a curse upon itself. So the promises of God belong to Christians who are the children of Abraham. These interpretations are prevalent, and I suggest that they are clearly anti-Semitic. After my own review of the literature on Galatians 3, 10 to 14, I have come to agree with James Dunn that a common assumption often underlies interpretations by viewing an unfortunate antithesis between Paul and Judaism. Furthermore, Dunn suggests that many theologians perceive this antithesis this distinct difference between Paul and Judaism, Paul, Christianity, and Judaism, as the central focus in understanding Paul. Before we proceed, I suggest you stop and ask yourself this question. Does my traditional understanding view Paul as Christian, thus distinct and different from Judaism? In contrast to this common understanding of an antithesis between Paul, Christianity, and Judaism, we will search for the meaning that Paul intended by viewing his argument as a method of Hebraic legal reasoning that employs methods of legal midrash to explain a specific situation in Galatia. I like Galatia rather than Galatia. By the startling nature of the literal meaning of this passage, Paul seems to be alerting us that he will continue to use methods of legal midrash that will point to a different, deeper understanding than the literal words convey. We will see that the interpretation stemming from Paul's midrash, which uncovers deep meaning from the Hebrew scriptures, will differ substantially from both the literal meaning and from our traditional view of this passage. So, if Paul is using methods of Hebraic legal reasoning, then the simple or plain meaning of the words is not what he intends. For example, by using the phrase curse of the law, Paul does not mean that the law brings a curse on Israel, nor does it bring a curse on those individuals who try to obey it, or who try to obey it in a legalistic manner, or fail to obey it completely. As we proceed to understand Paul's Midrash in these verses, we will see that the phrase curse of the law is part of a Hebraic argument that leads the reader to a deeper aspect of meaning in the Hebrew scriptures. The deeper meaning solves a practical problem for which scripture has no plain or literal answer. Why? were uncircumcised Gentiles in Galatia who did not know the law, why were they doing works of righteousness by performing miracles? That's the question that Paul is addressing here. Furthermore, we will see that Paul's Hebraic argument portrays neither inadequacy of the law nor observance of the law as a way to please God. Instead, Paul's legal midrash will answer two questions in these next four verses that we're going to consider that arise from a practical problem in Galatia. Okay, we've already addressed the first question in the last Midrash. Now, in what we're about to do, Paul is going to address these questions. First, how is it possible that Gentiles who exhibit the presence of God's Spirit by doing miracles have entered into the covenant that God first made with Abraham and his physical descendants, the children of Israel? The second question, which is perhaps of greater importance to Christians today, since God has apparently bestowed the Spirit on those with faith in Christ, then how do those believers, both Jew and Gentile, participate in the covenant community and live in a way that pleases God? We will see that the answer to this second question does not dismiss the law, but explains how a Christian's faith in Christ can encourage him to walk in the ways of the law by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now we're ready to take a look at Paul's ancient method of argument that we're going to find in these four verses. The structure of Paul's argument in Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 to 14, is a continuation of the preceding verses 6 to 9. In the earlier verses, Paul uses two words 
to convey a conclusion, so and therefore. Now, I want you to listen again to these two conclusions from the former Midrash. So, meaning consequently, you know that the ones of faith, these very ones are sons of Abraham. And then the other conclusion in the, in the previous Midrash, therefore, the result is that the ones of faith are blessed together with Abraham's faith. Now, in verses 10 through 13, Paul leads the argument forward by using a word twice. The word is for, so for something. For is leading it forward. And then Paul draws a deduction by saying it is evident. Now, what he's going to say is not in Scripture, so it's a deduction. He's making a deduction. It is evident. We also see that Paul is continuing to construct his argument from the Hebrew Scriptures by citing not two verses, but this time he's going to cite four specific verses. We remember that two citations may indicate the presence of an analogy that is characteristic of legal midrash. So what we're going to get here is four verses. So two will be an analogy, and the other two will be an analogy, and then Paul is going to make a conclusion from those two analogies. And, and we remember that two citations indicate the presence of an analogy that is characteristic of legal midrash. An analogy is when you see a relationship between two verses. So let us begin by examining the four citations. Again, I'm going to raise my voice when I get to the citations. All are thoroughly cursed who do not live by all that is written in the book of the law to do them, meaning the laws. And then in the next verse, the one who is righteous will live by faith. And in verse 12, the one doing them, meaning the commandments, will live by them. And in verse 13, thoroughly cursed is everyone who hangs on a wooden stake. Only by understanding Paul's method of argument in Galatians 3, 10 to 13, will we be able to fully appreciate his dramatic conclusion in Galatians 3, 14. Paul is explaining what he has discovered by telling us how he uncovered veiled meaning from Scripture. To make sense of this ancient method of extracting new meaning from Scripture, which is legal midrash, let us first review what we learned in Galatians 3, 6-9. Okay, I think this is important. Let's just go back and review what we did as a summary here before we proceed. Paul starts in verses 6 to 9. He starts with two verses of Scripture that are legally and conceptually similar. Paul then conducts a reciprocal analogy as a deduction. From the deduction of this reciprocal analogy, he can draw a conclusion which he declares twice. The second, we just heard those two conclusions, and the second is an expansive repetition of the first. We were able to follow Paul's Midrash in Galatians 3, 6-9 with the help of Menachem Elon's carefully crafted description of methods of legal Midrash that he believes were in use at the time of Paul. Now, as we turn to unravel Galatians chapter 3, verses 10-13, to 13, we observe that Paul is citing not two, but four verses. Considering Paul's rapid and repetitive use of the ancient literary device of chiasmus in his earlier artistic language, it's not surprising to find that these four citations are in the same traditional chiastic construction, which we call ABBA. So the A lines are parallel, the B lines are parallel. It's like a sandwich. The A lines are the bread and the B lines are in the middle. The B lines are the chiastic center. So A, B, B, A. The first and last A quotations are connected by the repetition of thoroughly cursed, which helps make them legally and conceptually similar. The two Middle B citations are also in parallel alignment with each other by the connecting concept of living. 
The implied contrast to living, of course, is death, which is the consequence of being thoroughly cursed. We will see that these four citations in verses 10 to 13 form two separate but related reciprocal analogies. One analogy is in the A parallel verses, and the other analogy is in the B parallel verses. At the end of our analysis, now we're going to start with the A lines first. So at the end of the analysis of the A lines, we will then be drawn to the two B lines in the middle of a chiastic construction, because in the middle of a chiasm is always very powerful. I am going to leave you now because there's a lot for you to ponder on what I've done before the next podcast when I, we're going to penetrate Paul's legal midrash. So take some time to just go through this and, and thoroughly understand it. And then when you're ready for the next podcast, we will really roll up our sleeves and get into Paul's midrash in Galatians uh, verses 10 to 13.